Perfect. Um, so good morning, afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. So first, I want to thank the organizers for not losing the momentum to COVID, and um, just gonna keep the keep the ball rolling. Um, so we had a very interesting talks so far on on Polaris, so I want to uh, shift the gears a bit and talk about some of our studies on. <clears throat> hybrid platforms of the atoms with uh, photonics structure and uh, basically our, uh, our perspective and motivation for pushing this uh, hybrid systems in the strongly interacting limit. So most of the work I'm presenting here has been done uh, during my time in Tillman Paul's group in Germany as a group leader and towards the end also show some of the things that um, we'll, be carrying, we'll be doing here in my new lab here at Purdue. Um, so, uh, we, um, I think what actually ties all of us together is the y matter interaction. Um, so, let's just uh, go a bit uh, to the basics and see uh, what we are looking for when we are talking about the y matter interaction. So, if we go to our uh, favorite system, a uh, simple system like a two-level atom, uh, then the cross-section of the atoms that basically what it interacts with the field is related to the um, it's uh, resonance or emission wavelength per square. That's basically like the perceived uh, atomic cross section. And now if uh, we want to talk to this atom uh, via uh, light, um, so we have like the, the efficiency of this uh, interaction basically related to the uh, um, similarity of the atomic cross sections to the light cross sections. And uh, from our uh, basic uh, optics, we remember that we cannot uh, squeeze the light below the diffraction limit. So that's basically uh, like a um, so that's basically like some of the uh, fundamentals with like a, a microscopic uh, objects that we can do just to squeeze the light. So the question that we were asking ourselves since we were just uh, were very interested in atoms, seeing that if we can really improve it, and then the answer is then of course uh, we can um, uh, basically think about two approaches. So far, uh, as we perceived in literature, one was using uh, cavities, which basically is like the paradigm of the cavity QED. The uh, idea is kind of rather uh, simple and self-explanatory. So if I have a high finesse cavity to trap the photons and make it interrogate with the atom over and over, so I can increase this uh, efficiency of the coupling by a uh, number of round trips. And then the other option is uh, basically increasing the number of atoms uh, when uh, a light passes through, and that basically pushes us to the limit of the dense ensemble. And these are basically like the main motivations for two uh, particular experiments that have been done in our group, uh, basically using the, the cavities or nanophotonics, and also going to the regime of strong um, or dense um, <clears throat> atomic ensemble. Uh, and of course, just kind of uh, basically just give a shout out to uh, the very nice experiments, like a prime neuron experiments of the cavity QED by Serge Harloch, uh, using like uh, highly excited Rydberg atoms uh, to see the interaction with the microwave photons. And of course, like a lot of uh, subsequent work uh, using the, the similar concept, but in different platforms, for example, like the atoms being trapped in high uh, finesse microscopic cavities, for example, like the experiments in Gerhard Rempel's group at MPQ that they were using the optical lattices uh, loaded in a high finesse cavity. And here you nicely see that the uh, radius is splitting uh, due to the coupling of the atoms with the cavity. Or we can think about like the atom-like uh, um, system uh, very related to like the polariton branches that we were talking about. And then, for example, quantum dots in a cavity, which was one of the early demonstrations, just showing like the photon blockade effect and the uh, uh, anti bunching dip here that appears because of the photon blockade. Or the uh, some of the also other platforms using ions, and then we can uh, rather more easily trap them because they are charged particles. So we can use like the trap fiber, just the kind of optical fibers. And then uh, trap the ions uh, in the ion trap, uh, use the light for basically kind of readout, ex excitation and readout. So these are some of the examples so far. And as you can see, it's kind of the, the playground is already uh, pretty well um, large and uh, explored. So then you may ask, okay, if there is like any merit of using nanophotonics and just kind of using them 
uh, with the atoms because it basically is like opening the whole can of worms. We have like the interaction of the atoms with the surface. So we should really have like a good reason just to move in that direction. And hopefully I can uh, persuade you that indeed is the case. Uh, one of the reasons that we are very interested uh, in using nanophotonic system uh, was basically like the Rayleigh diffraction limit uh, constraint that we have. Uh, if we basically use the structures that they have features on the order of wavelength, or below that, we can beat the diffraction limit. And that basically they're going to increase us the efficiency of the light matter interaction. Um, also, we uh, kind of heard uh, interesting talks about like the engineering of the dispersion, uh, which is kind of uh, more manageable in the nanophotonics structure. For example, we, can, we could have a kind of singularity close to the band gap, and we could have also other band engineering uh, coming uh, with uh, basically spatially changing the structure. Uh, we could also have high tunability of the local density of optical states, which that simply means that we can control the, the personal enhancement, we can uh, control the coupling of the emitter to the bath and control the ratio between the coherence and uh, decoherence phenomena. And of course, uh, we could have like the long uh, range atom-atom interaction mediated by uh, uh, the structures. Uh, and of course, uh, th there has been like a lot of interesting studies, uh, mainly pioneered by Jeff Kimball's group at Caltech. Uh, and and uh, they were basically uh, using, uh, for example, like a toroids and uh, coupling them to the, to the cesium atoms in a mod, or like using the optical dipole traps uh, close to the photonic waveguides and cavities. And here, for example, you can see the very interesting uh, results basically showing the uh, coupling of a quantum emitter, the cesium atom, uh, optically cooled and trapped close to a nanobin, and you can see the distinct coupling uh, to the T and TM modes of this waveguide. So for our platform, uh, we were mainly interested to push the limit uh, not to use the ultra cold atoms, but use the thermal atoms, and we were basically kind of interested in using uh, first the uh, rather simplicity of the thermal system, but at the same time also the uh, more uh, tunable control of the density of the atomic system. So with that idea in mind, we were just kind of really exploring the, what are the limits of the uh, doing like a coherent control uh, using the nanophotonic system interface with the atomic structure. And um, in this particular talk, I'll be talking about two experiments that uh, we did one was uh, basically using the two photon spectroscopy of rubidium atoms with the idea of uh, exciting the atoms to highly excited Rydberg levels, benefiting from the Rydberg blockade and atom atom interaction, and of course, uh, the features like EIT. And then the other one was basically uh, benefiting from very uh, uh, tightly confined and squeezed uh, light geometry uh, to go to quasi 1D geometries and investigate the atom-atom interaction in low dimensional uh, regime. So uh, the, um, uh, the vacuum cell that we're working with is just a kind of homebrew uh, vapor cell and just uh, again pushing to the limit of miniaturization. Uh, so we basically uh, make the cell using the ionic, ionic bonding and you can kind of uh, easily recognize the photonic chip that we have here and it's kind of uh, pumped down to 10 to the minus uh, 7, 8 millibar, and it's connected to the rubidium reservoir. So we can release the atoms easily toward the region of our interest. And then uh, I don't need to kind of advertise, advertise it as we uh, nicely saw in the different uh, figures from the photonic structure, but the merit is that we can really kind of condense a lot of different devices and investigate uh, the different regimes of interaction that we are interested in. Um, although the devices are kind of uh, different, but the working principles, at least for most of the devices that we're working on, are quite similar. So we have the device uh, built on a transparent substrate. We couple in and out the light by integrating couplers. And um, of course, these are like our atoms, the quantum emitters. Uh, and um, this is just the zoom-in version of the device. We have the borosilicate substrate. Uh, for some uh, technical reason, that was the one that we found uh, rather inert uh, respect to rubidium. 
And then uh, the device in our case was uh, made of silicon nitride, uh, which is also rather low loss material at the transition wavelength of rubidium at 780 near infrared region. And then uh, we had to photolithographically uh, define the inner uh, region of interest uh, and basically uh, prevent the atom to interact with the other regions that we are not interested. So that's why we have like a, a thick layer of the glass on top of the device. And then um, to protect any further uh, interaction of rubidium, chem chemical interaction of rubidium with the surface, we had the thin uh, high quality uh, alumina layer deposited on the surface. And also we have like the aluminum just to make sure that we're basically blocking off any stray light coming to our detector. So that's really the very uh, simple principles of the device. And now let's look at the, some of the systems that we have. Um, here is just a two photon um, excitation uh, with the idea of just uh, sending the atoms uh, to upstate. That's just a bit complicated, but let me just walk you through it. Um, so that's the simple cartooner schematic that we have. Here we have two photon spectroscopy. We have the first transition from the S level to the P level uh, via the 780 coming from the top. So we have the laser locked here. And then the other laser just sending the atom to the excited uh, 4D state where we have like more extended electron wave function and larger interaction with the atoms uh, via scanning the telecom laser around the transition from uh, P to D level. And that's exactly <coughs> The scenario that we have here and then we basically collect uh, the scattered light from the alpha grading and then uh, we basically image it on a camera and later on a single photon counting uh, module because we want to really push the limit of the spectroscopy to the single photon level and then of course like the uh, the APD. So uh, since we are working with thermal atoms that's just a bit more tricky because uh, we can uh, basically have some residual Doppler uh, coming to the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we have to basically uh, take into account the velocity groups that we can, uh, we are not intended, we, we don't intend to excite, but then um, unfortunately we excite them because uh, they have like finite velocity. Um, so the, that's for um, the first step just to uh, highlight the levels that we do have the interaction uh, of the light with them. Uh, so we did just a simple subdoppler spectroscopy of the pump and probe in a bulk cell. And here you can see the uh, absorption lines uh, of rubidium from the transition from the S level to the D level pretty clearly here. So we have three uh, groups from the intermediate P level that we scan over and then we send them to D. So and overall, we have like about nine uh, transitions. And uh, that's basically uh, what we see. Now, if we go back to our device, uh, this is just a simple um, image showing the principles of our uh, measurement. We uh, excite uh, the input grading coupler and then we filter out the kind of go to the Fourier plane, filter it out, go to the um, image plane again, and uh, we make sure that we basically get the light from the output uh, side of the gradient coupler. And uh, we basically, this is the, the signal that we are getting from the waveguide. So uh, if I kind of put it together with the signal that we have from the reference, you, you already kind of notice the orders of magnitude uh, broadening. So all of these fine features that I already talk to you about uh, with the kind of nine transitions, they were already washed out in a much broad uh, spectrum. Reason being that here we have thermal atoms, so we have like the Doppler broadening, but more importantly, just remember that our devices are deep cell wavelength. We just have like about uh, hundreds of nanometers region of interest and the atoms are kind of interacting uh, with the photons uh, transiently. So we have a huge transit broadening on top of that. Uh, so we had to kind of uh, find a good way to describe it. Uh, so we basically use the uh, time resolved uh, Monte Carlo uh, scheme to evolve the density matrix in time. And uh, as you can see, our model uh, pretty well describes the data that we have. So we had like a good understanding about the, the signal that we were um, observing here. Um, one of the merits, as already advertised, is the um, 
squeeze light below the diffraction limit. Uh, so what that what does that mean? It means that the local intensity would be much much larger than what what we could get, for example, with free space. Uh, to test that, it's uh, to really externally measure it. That's kind of uh, rather straightforward. We can change the telecom power and look at the absorption directly. And as you can see, we are basically now pushing the limit to very few photon limit. So that's why we needed to do a lot of single photon spectroscopy. But the interesting trend is that as we keep increasing the telecom power, it reaches to a level that the absorption drops. So if I kind of uh, plot the broadening, just the homogeneous uh, part of the uh, line width as a function of telecom power, uh, you recognize the typical uh, square law behavior, which basically is the reminiscent of the saturation for a two level system that we have. So in this limit, uh, this is where we really need to do the single photon counting because as you can see, we are talking about very uh, weak uh, light inside the waveguide. And then in this uh, limit, that's where we are kind of increasing the power and then we can directly use the, the photo uh, diode to observe the saturation behavior. And then just to give you an idea about the squeezing that we are talking about. So this is the very tiny spot out of the waveguide that we have the atoms interacting with that. And that basically really, really uh, decreases us the saturation limit from the typical milliwatt per centimeter squared to something that we can go to the uh, few uh, femtowatt level. Um, so we were interested in the effect of the uh, density, as I said, just kind of uh, see more of a dense gas. Um, so uh, we were um, just uh, can increase the density or the, the number of atoms that we have in a cell uh, just by increasing the reservoir temperature. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, you'll see that uh, each line corresponds to different density. So you'll see that corresponding to uh, each density, we have the same trend uh, for different powers in the system. We have like a monotonic increase, but then there is like an inflation point that the behavior changes. And uh, this is kind of rather uh, intuitive if you go back to the picture that I showed you. So I have like a telecom power that really comes from the top and then it has to go through now a dense gas. And then from the old days of the just the lamp type when uh, time when he was kind of really investigating the propagation of the short pulses inside a dense medium, we know that how distorted the pulse will be, and then we have a lot of photon recycling behavior. But uh, if we include Hadise, that, I'm sorry, Hadise, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I would, uh, we, you would need to summarize now because we are coming to the end. Yes. Sure. Thank yes, you. yeah. Um, so then um, this is basically like, like the behavior that we have here. And uh, we can just include all of those, those behavior. So um, I think I would, I would kind of uh, rather skip briefly the, uh, just the, the rest. And I kind of just uh, give a one slide summary of the things that we are seeing about like the density effect at uh, a lower dimension. Uh, so uh, we can basically go to the slot waveguide geometry, which is basically like a very small region below the diffraction limit. And then you can see that by changing the thickness uh, of the uh, region of interest, we can really change the density. And uh, this is basically like some of the results that we were kind of comparing with Anton Bowe's group in Institute Geophic. And uh, it was kind of quite nice that both of the systems were kind of showing the same behavior in the cold and uh, thermal regime. Uh, so um, to summarize, uh, I basically talked about the, uh, the hybrid systems of the atoms and the photons. Um, I talked about the merit of the systems basically to reduce the threshold of the interaction. And on top of it, I talked about the um, the merit of these systems to really allow us to probe the atom-atom interaction uh, down to the sub-wavelength regime. So, yeah, I think with that, I would like to uh, conclude and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Hadise. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Uh, no, and unfortunately we are running. I had a question, but maybe I can ask you uh, later on. Uh, so we need to move on to the next uh, to the next uh, talk.